Okay, well, he's working that. So a couple of months ago, uh, Joe asked me to give a technical talk, and I said, well, we have so many technical talks here. And James, how, how, do, you, how do you follow up a James Sizek technical talk? You know, he's the master. So uh, I decided I would do a little change, and so I'm going to try not to be technical. And instead, today, we're going to talk about the power of cheese. I bet you've never gone to a ham radio meeting and talked about cheese. But I thought this was a, a great thing. So as Joe said, uh, I am Doug Sharp, K2AD. I am an NCARC member. And I'm also a Rocky Mountain Ham member. I'm a Calcon supporter. I've worked with CCARC. So, but, uh, so we're going to talk today about the power of cheese. And I'll see if Dave can click us forward. What is the power of cheese? Mommy, Daddy, Santa cookies. Hurry, hurry. Whoa. Those must have been some cookies you left, Santa. I didn't leave them cookies. I left them cheese. Behold the power of the cheese. <laughs> so she didn't leave Santa cookies. She left him cheese. And this is the tie-in to the Santa on the air. So I decided, what is the power of cheese? So I Googled it. Everybody Googles things these days. And it said it's a powerful way to deliver essential nutrients. OK. You know, uh, lots of kinds. I love the part that there was lactose intolerant cheese. So if you're lactose intolerant, you're OK in this meeting. Uh, the, uh, but everywhere I looked, I couldn't find why cheese was so powerful. What is the power of cheese? Now let's see here. No? Maybe turn it on. Or Dave can just click to the next slide. <laughs> there we go. No, but you went too many, I think. Okay. So what is our cheese? What does this have to do with ham radio? That little girl tried something out of the box, and boy, did Santa deliver. You probably saw in that room there were puppy dogs, wagons, dolls, sports car, a convertible. <laughs> That's the power of cheese. So what's our power of cheese? It's embracing new concepts, as I said. Be different. Probably, yes. That's the power of cheese. And by the way, this talk is intended to be interactive. Grab a microphone. Don't, Jim, don't hog it over there. Uh, and over there, you know, and those of you online, chime in. Uh, this, is, this is intended to be a fun talk, not just we're going to talk about how many dBs and how many gigahertz for micro watts per nanometer. Uh, but to me, the power of cheese is, as I put up here, let's create some solutions that people need. Let's have some fun with this stuff. And let's serve our community as we go. So enjoy the ride. It's pretty good cheese. So we're going to uh, this one. So I, I started this talk from a, a presentation that James gave uh, about our microwave and backbone and all these things. And kind of the hint. That's part of the cheese. But that enables us to make the cheese. So I looked back to the 1990s, and I thankfully don't remember who all these people are. But if you do in this group, and you know who's in those photos, well, other than Nelson Mandela, I know him. But uh, you're better than me. But 30 years ago now, we were analog based. To link our repeaters together was very complicated, and I don't know where Greg went. Uh, but how many times did you have to go up the mountain to work on the repeater when our, with our old analog links? A lot. So we had limited uh, interoperability, and we really didn't have any remote diagnostics. So what was James and Joe doing yesterday, fixing things on Buckhorn? Did you get it on pretty much the first try? OK, yeah. <laughs> We have their fuse holder that's more like a resistor. And for those of you that can't see it, it's 
The tines are brown. Uh, it's melted and deformed. Not the worst fuse I've ever seen in my life. I was telling Joe I was working on a HF amplifier and it had some glass cartridge fuses in it. And every time we turned the switch on, we just heard the thing going like, whoa, why isn't it blowing the fuse? So I reached down there, I pulled the thing out and the guy that's working on it with me goes, what size fuse is that? And I said, quarter 20, no blow. They had put a piece of a bolt in there for a fuse. <laughs> Quarter 20 no blows don't blow. So 30 years ago, yeah, we didn't have a lot of technology. But here in 2020, and this is what was originally going to be the name of my talk. It's not what we did. This talk is not about the microwave backbone, what we built. This is why we did it, what we can use it for. And I found that nifty little 2020 logo, and that's all the social media icons since we kind of are in a decade of social media, unfortunately. Uh, but we now have broadband, lots of bits to all of our sites. We can nearly completely remotely diagnose. The only thing we can't do right yet, yet, is measure the power output on the repeaters. We can look at the link statuses, we can reconfigure the parameters, the beeps, the timeouts turn it on and off, change the links. All of that's trivial now. I remember when I was a young ham, we used to have to do all that by touch tone. Uh, boy, was that a, a pain. So it's very easy to link these things together. And we have communications modes today that I barely dreamed about. You know, I first got my license in 1977. I was in junior high school. All I could really dream about was slow scan TV and RIDI and sideband and CW, and now what do we have? So, and. Clearly, Doug doesn't mind dating himself. <laughs> hey, you know, as, and this thing is not working again. Can, are you able to just hit the next slide, Dave? Um, so, uh, okay. So, here, fix that. Do something technical, Joe, beyond being a president. Yeah, you need, we need a new fuse. So, uh, yeah, I'm dating myself with being a ham since 1977. And, uh, uh, but as somebody said to me, you're a fossil now, but you're holding up well. So the IP backbone is one of the pieces of cheese that I wanted to talk about today. It's often called the arm ham backbone. That's not what it is now. That's what it started. But we had other groups like NCARC, our club, that bought into this concept. This is one of the big toys that Santa left. And fun machines, Colorado Connection is built into it, the Aurora Repeater Association. It is now bigger than any of one of our clubs. And it really can't stand without all the clubs because it's like taking our football, one player, and going home. But we built something that's really great. What did I put here? Yeah, we can go to the repeater site without going to the repeater site. Uh, and we were talking about field days and things. We can take this backbone and extend it down to our field events. So. We probably don't need the microwave backbone at field day because that's kind of a localized thing. But when we do the WWV events, uh, when we do ARIES events and we want data, we can drop that down and, and go, did we get this working or do I ask Dave? Okay, Dave to hit the next one. Uh, so this is where I stole from James uh, Deck. On the upper right, I know it's a little small, is where our microwave network for our club here was in 2022. And when we first started the microwave backbone, I, I want to say it was around 2012, we started experimenting with 3 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz ham. It was like four sites. Now we're over 100. Uh, and you can see the picture on the bottom is the Colorado connection that you can't really read those. 
And, uh, uh, but Colorado Connection uses this backbone to go all the way from our Fort Collins repeater on the north to our Salida repeater on the south and east and west from Burlington at the state line on the east to Grand Junction on the west um, with another spur down to Durango is what's on that. That's where we can go on this backbone. And we could go into Horsetooth Mountain, simple cross connection, come out in Durango if we needed to. That's the power of cheese. And it also does All-Star, DMR, Fusion. What did I forget? I can't read through I can't see my slides through the P25. It's everything IP. Yes, Gabe. And get, get the microphone so they can hear you online. Step up to the microphone. For the IP backbone, uh, what are you guys using for a service provider? Are you using an existing ISP or are you using a, like a block of like the, yep. the 44 we are, subnet block? For we are users? not an ISP. Uh, so we do not use ISPs. And we have our own sub block in the 10 network uh, that we self route internally as private. <laughs> and occasionally we'll have an internet gateway so we can send traffic out to other places, but uh, that's one fundamental thing that's important. This backbone that NCARC, RM Ham, all the clubs built, we are not an ISP. We're not there to provide people internet service. Well, uh, that's not, not appropriate not for ham radio. Not that you are an ISP, but like, I was wondering like, at your end points where you would, you would get data remotely, who are you using? Uh, we, we go into a variety of ISPs at, I don't know, probably about six of our locations, one of which is CSU here. Uh, that we can navigate down and gateway down. So, not today. Well, not today because there was a flood in the IDF closet. But uh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so the backbone supports everything IP, and this is still not going. Okay. We can do some remote diagnostics. So we talked about that. We can look at power strips and cameras and door sensors and. That's, that's pretty, pretty cool stuff to help us with what's going on. We have a uh, site monitoring system that, and I know this is an eye chart, but if you could read this, if you were standing two feet in front of the screen, this, this is every site we have in the state, or and even beyond the state, uh, that we can see where this, this particular software goes out and remotely checks or pings the, uh, all the devices that we have put into here every about anywhere from one to five minutes. And if it stops responding, it flags it in red and we know to go fix it. Uh, and all of our club things are on this common screen. So you're probably seeing a common theme here of we make the cheese together. If everybody had to build this, it would be very expensive and very complicated. It helps to really have potluck suppers rather than dedicated things. But this is where I wanted to spend a little time. And uh, the art of the possible that we like to talk about. Joe talked about the QRV vehicles. Uh, we have a number of these that right now they're anchored in Rocky Mountain Ham because that's who they were given to uh, by, uh, I'll say, if, if you're at all wondering which broadcast station to listen to out of Denver, I shouldn't tell you this, but CBS4 gives us a lot of these vans. They're good community partners. Uh, that one on the left there, the lower left, is the QRV3, and that was what we set up at our field day last year. Uh, we have James Sizek has one in his possession that's we call the QRV4. Any CW operators here in the room? What does QRV mean in CW? What is it a short abbreviation for? Low power. Are you ready? Ah, QRV, uh, that's QRP, Steve, is low power. This is Queen Radio Victor. I'm ready to receive and send. So when we send these vans out, we were trying to say, well, what do we call them when they get there and they set up their QRV? They're ready to go. They're ready to transmit and ready to operate. So it also stands for quick response vehicle or quick 
restoral vehicle. I, I think I like quick response better. It's easier to say. But these vans are around. We have one up at James House now that we're outfitting in, what is he considered, Berthet, I guess? Yeah. But you know where James is. There's one at my house in Firestone. So we have two in the club's primary service area. We've got another one, the QRV2, the old van, and that's now down in Evergreen. We just sent another one down to Canyon City with Jeff Carrier and Amanda Alden. And they also have a satellite truck. I keep stepping on your case. There, Joe. Um, and uh, so they have a vehicle without a mast that's an operating position, and they have a, now a vehicle with a mast that they're outfitting down in Canyon City. Then we've got the comm trailer. Uh, we haven't yet deployed one out to the west of Colorado, but we're working on it. So we've anchored these in there under RM Ham just because we needed a 501 to put them under, but they're not just RM Hams. We can use them here. Uh, and Joe uh, my, made the comment of, I said, user groups supplement with the comm pods. So we're gonna put the core equipment in there. We're gonna put the satellite internet, an ISP in there, but we're also gonna have some microwave that we can shoot to our access points that's over on the right. I'll get to that. We're gonna keep the rotators and the core equipment permanently mounted in the van, but what happens is every user of this van wants a little different stuff. So we're not gonna rack it up in hard racks anymore. It's, there may be a compod in there. Is that what you call them, compods or go kits or? No. Lots of names. Compods, it's, it's going to, it's, it's designated for the van. Yeah. So. You drop your compod in, you can own your equipment, you can manage your equipment. And if you wanna leave it in there, great. And if somebody else needs something different, we move it out, put it in, there'll be standardized plugs. James and I and John that has the QRV2. So the QRV2, three and four, we're gonna have identical plugs so you can just drop your payload in and operate. And so, might be different if we're R1D1 up here in Weld Larimer and we go to B Cares, whatever they are, R1. Three. R3. R1D3. R1D3, thank you. I don't have the magic decoder ring out of yeah, my cereal box. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but they might have a totally different yeah. pod because they have a different operational mode. We can support that. We talked a little bit about the access points. This is what this big Santa Claus uh, living room we can probably from this parking lot, the van could put a microwave antenna up and hit one of our access points and light up the backbone in this parking lot. If we're doing ARES, that, that's, that's a pretty powerful thing. We can do the amateur VoIP telephones. They're VoIP telephones, IP phones. And uh, we got a little bit of a cutoff, but I put on the bottom the portable cows, sows, and goats. Uh, that's, those are industry terms. Anybody know what a cow? On Sell on wheels. A sow? It's a sight on wheels. What's a goat? Greatest of all time. <laughs> Generator on a trailer. <laughs> those are the cellular terms for them, but James has deployable repeaters. He's got uh, some that are repeaters in a box that again, if you get out to an event and you need a repeater on a box, rather than having it hard plumbed into the van, we're gonna put it on a go, go case, a compod. You can run it in the van, and if you say, well, we need it somewhere else, we need the van over here, we take the thing out and put it up on the, put it, split them apart. So, we can do a lot of things, and I seem to have, this thing is, oh, they're not liking me. So, being my theme is the power of cheese, let's talk some con queso, or queso dip. Uh, we talked about today, I think most of these, with the exception of Vara, I don't think we really, but for ARES, Joe, does ARES use Winlink? Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kind of, yeah. Tuesday. And that was a loaded question because I know uh, Joe's been very much promoting that. So is Jim Dixon, who 
when I talked to him, he said he couldn't make it today. Uh, he's going to be traveling. But uh, we can send WinLink through AX25. We can send it through VARA. We can also send it through IP. And if we had that backbone connection, that's the art of the possible. A lot of ways to do this. Uh, we know about our all-star, you know, we were talking about field day and I mentioned to Greg, uh, at the field day I go to, we also had sideband, CW, and FT8, and all the antennas were right next to each other. Those little radios just were folding up. And when we were using, we mentioned Rob Sherwood's list, when we were using radios that were lower down on Rob's list, those receivers were just overloading. We couldn't possibly work together, but we, and there's nothing wrong with those radios that are on the bottom of the list. When you're operating at your house and you're a mile from the next station, they're gonna work great. But when you're 100 feet away, it's not so good. So we brought radios that were higher on the list and you saw that picture of the van in the field. That was 600 feet away from our other station. And we chose to walk up there as some, who was it that said, oh, I don't want to do that. We're too far from the whiteboard and from the porta potty. Uh, but you could do a remote station. That's very easy to do these days, or it's becoming easier. Just do a short haul, two gig, five gig, 60 gig microwave link across your field day site. We are starting to put remote HF stations on the backbone at some of our radio sites that have big towers with not a lot of antennas on them. That's the power of the cheese. And I don't know how many more slides I have, but, oh, so we talked about the operating events, uh, simulated emergency tests, sets. Uh, there's one maybe today, field day, the public service events. Uh, I know, uh, that's what I was. What we did with the backbone, to link our repeaters, to do the multiple modes, to bring down to the vans. That's the power of cheese. So when James comes up here and says, I need another $1,500 for blah, you guys know what it's, how are we using it? This is how we're using it. We do a good job. This club is one of the best in the state of giving back and serving the community. I can think of I don't know if there's a list of the top five public serving clubs, but if there is, this club is on that list. That's something to be proud of. Uh, the ARL section, and I think I've got a slide on this, but what have I missed? What, what do we do with our cheese to serve? You know, so I think this thing is just timing out. Hit me, Dave. The one thing I wanted to mention, this may be the last slide. I intentionally didn't do a lot of slides because I really wanted to try to get you guys talking. And maybe Greg is coming up to the microphone, but there is an ARL Colorado section then. Uh, it's the second Monday of each month, usually run by Amanda, K1DDN, our section manager. She will have a technical talk or a featured talk or a administrative talk feature in there. And last we counted, I think two nets ago when I did the count, we were on 60 repeaters, six zero wow. in Colorado with that net. One of which, our Buckhorn Mountain, which I guess sort of works. We got to get it working by the second Monday. We've got a little bit of time for that. June. Um, <laughs> I talked to James. He called me this morning and we talked about that. Uh, so. Uh, but it's on the Colorado Connection on all 16 VHF repeaters. It's on the Rocky Mountain Ham Wide Talk Group, and I should know how many are on that talk group, but there's at least 24, at least two dozen. Uh, the Mark system up in the mountains, the fun machine, and then Jeff has taken the all-star feed that we use for our repeaters and crossed it over to P25 and digital modes. So there, those aren't even, I just counted those as one repeater. 
uh, but that's a virtual network. All this because we have a digital backbone that we could I, implement a common technology and link ourselves together when we need to. We're not just covering the same patch of dirt with four repeaters every day. But when we need to, we can do that. That's the power of cheese. Uh, Greg. Yeah, you've got the awesome backbone, which goes like from what, Cheyenne to somewhere in New Mexico and... There, there's a little gap in New Mexico, yeah. but that's a good yeah. point yeah. that we also go from into Armham, New Mexico, our sister group, and they go all the way down to Albuquerque and points further, but we have to do a VPN and a hop through right. so commercial there's a little internet, gap right but now. we're working to yeah. make that all ham yeah. microwave. Yeah, so Good there's point. a little bit of a gap right now, and you're yep. working on getting all the way out to the western slope and out to Kansas, and all of this is a, I won't say a private network, it's independent of the internet. Correct. And self-supporting and Correct. rerouting and all these other things, and it's capable of very broadband data. So this is a very, very big block of cheese, very thick, huge, fat block of cheese. It's got some but holes when in it you, that we have to VPN, but yeah. maybe it's Swiss cheese. Yes, but when you link it to a repeater, either, uh, either an analog repeater, or digital, or, or one of these other things, a Vara station or Winlink or something, yeah. it becomes cheese whiz. And you can't get a lot of data fast through cheese whiz. Have you thought, because you have the ability, I know you have some sites with sector, microwave sector antennas. Correct. And when we did the WWV event, we had the backbone there through a sector antenna. For some things like Aries events and, and other events, it's really good to have that big fat block of cheese that you can push live video through and pictures and streaming data. And instead of getting on a microphone and reading off, as I hear on the exercises, the hospital has this many units of plasma, just email spread or zip spreadsheets out to people through the big fat yep. block of cheese and don't use the cheese whiz. Well, and I like, I like your analogy to cheeses, so thank you for that. Um, that's, I, I made the effort there. Though. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I appreciate that. Uh, because when I first decided to not just make this a boring technical talk and I was trying to come up with something, I don't know how the power of cheese came to my head, but it did. Uh, so the backbone is, it's got a, lot, a fair amount of capacity. The slowest link we have will carry 10 megabits of data. Some of the fastest are over 100 megabits, but it varies depending on where you are in, in the whiz. There's some lumps in the, in the cheese whiz. So I'll get to you in just a second. Um, so, but the sectors are very important and that is because our microwave sites on the mountains are point to point because we don't want to dilute that and have less data. Our sectors that we have, and we have sectors I know, I don't know if we have one on Buckhorn, but I know we have them on Horsetooth, Namaqua, Lee Hill, and El Dorado Mountain for our area. All we have to do is hit one of those, so now when they hand you this with as simple as one of these, I don't know who brought these, but uh, thank you, Mike. Great <laughs> bullet from uh, Microtech bullet. Or is this a ubiquity? That's a ubiquity bullet. Uh, the Microtechs are a metal case. But uh, put one of these on a directional antenna and you're hitting the sector. You're in, and that's exactly what we did at WWV's event. We just hit one of the horse tooth sectors. If we're down in Boulder, we hit the Lee Hill sector. The Longmont Club that's kind of, I don't know, is it partnered or uh, uh, we have, a, they use the sector on Lee Hill to actually connect their justice center. We're now starting to connect our EOCs to these. So now we get a big long list of things and they, we say, okay, well, I could send it on two meter voice 
That's going to be a pretty long read. I could send it on AX25 packet. I could send it on VARA. If my EOC is connected into the backbone, I can use, is it called WinLink IP? Or I can set up an IP connection, and now you're going to have megabits of data. VAR is good. It's like 9,600, but 10 megabits is better. Um, yeah. It's, it's like that, you know, somebody was playing me a clip of that movie T Team America World Police and they said it's 911 times 1000 and you know what that is 911000 <laughs> so uh, but uh, but this is the things we can do and then I'll start to wrap up and yes good two questions um, first are there any plans to upgrade the infrastructure to support maybe a gigabit in the future and what modulation methods are you using uh, on like on the OSI, like level one, like the physical layer. And are you using any error, any error correction? Okay, so those are good questions. And I promise this would be not a super technical talk, but I'll, I'll dive into the pool a little bit with you. Are we gonna go much faster? No, uh, we don't need to. Uh, we don't have a need for gigabit capability because right now for digital voice, we need 50 kilobits. Uh, for the, the most bandwidth intensive things are the security cameras at our sites. Uh, so we're just not gonna do that because to get that kind of bandwidth, I need to go to very expensive and high frequency microwave radios is I can't use, and this is again a ubiquity, but we use some micro tick bullets and that's like a $250 device. I don't know what these cost, Mike, from Ubiquity, but um, I think around 50 bucks yeah, these are cheap. Uh, the NetMetal 5 radios that we use on our main backbone are 250 bucks. I, I may be a little off on the prices due to the inflation we've been seeing a little lately, but uh, to get up to the gigabit, I've got to go to an 11 gig radio with complex modulation. Those are a minimum of like $2,000 in end, plus it's commercial radio, so we've got to go get a commercial license, which we can do. We can pass our ham traffic through a commercial microwave, but the coordination process, just to get a frequency, is over $1,000. If we stick to five gigs and anywhere from 10 to 100 megabits, we are in the $1,500 price range for two ends of a link. So that's a full link. And that's why we're not gonna go higher because, now if someday we, you say, well, we really need to get HDTV, well, that's under 10 megabits, depending on what they're running and putting in there. But if we ever needed it, we could go there. But uh, did I see another question or? Yes, like what modulation method the physical layer used? Uh, the physical layer, it is an OFDM derivative, and it's the standard ones that are developed in 802.11, and they're derivatives. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank so, you. And what am I supposed to be done, Joe? When you want to be. Well, when are people going to start to get up and leave and say, do I have another slide, Dave, or I think this may be the end? Okay. Yep. It's my questions, comments, and complaints. And you are more than welcome to file complaints. Uh, please write them all in the back of a $100 bill, and I promise I will read every one uh, personally. And if you'd like to file multiple complaints, you may, but please use a separate form for each. Uh, so, and all complaint forms will be given to Darren to go into the club treasury, by the way. Well, so. For me, it may not make it. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, Darren's gonna keep those in serial number order and Darren, put them in our bank. Yeah, well, just temporarily. So I, I wrote some notes here that, and we can talk a little bit, but I talked about the QR, just little things as Joe was going, he reminded me. QRV use in the pods, we have a QRV. It may not be owned by the club here, but it's available to the club. We should consider ourselves foster parents of it when it goes out. There are some restrictions for taking it out because 
In the case of the one up in Bertha, James pays the insurance and the registration. The one in Firestone, I pay it. So if you go out and smash that thing up, it's on you. It's, so for that reason, we only let people drive it that have put time and effort to build it because we know they're going to take very good care of it. Uh, we used to give it to Darren all the time, and every time he would return it with the things that were broken fixed. Uh, so, really? Yeah, he was. Ve he's very good about that. Uh, and I know Darren's uh, uh, attempts to not be technical sometimes. He's very good. Uh, talked about field day. I put on my note here. Uh, so my suggestion is use the better radios on the Rob Sherwood list. Try to get them a little bit apart and consider some bandpass filters. That won't help you with 20 meters to 20 meters, but it will help you with 10 meters to 20 meters and such. Uh, the only other thing I didn't mention that's enabled by our backbone is we just got a donation from one of the county emergency management groups uh, down south of us a little bit. And they said, we have all of these radios and we don't know what to do with them. They're VHF mobiles. And I said, well, I think we could put them to good use. So we've taken them in as a donation into the 501c3 pool. And they're VHF 50 watt commercial radios. You're wrong, you're right. They are Motorola and they'll do DMR. So we have started an initiative to, uh, we're gonna be working with one of the RM Ham guys that is beyond brilliant. He's an extremely smart technical guy and he has social skills. He's a graduate of MIT. <laughs> it's rare to find somebody with those kind of skills. He's gonna start working on integrating them with DMR data. And I've talked to a member of this club who's not here tonight, and we're trying to see if we can find a volunteer that would do some uh, work to interface them with just plain AX25 and APRS and VARA FM, such that we could either do all these modes or just one mode on these, and then we're gonna get them out to the ARIES groups that want them maybe some individuals as long as you don't go and sell it because you know they were given into the clubs and i say clubs they're just held by arm ham right now but we're going to distribute these around so that we could go to an eoc and have ax25 or winlink which is over ax25 or vara or the one a very good digital mode that you've never wanted to use DMR data. We have a lot of DMR repeaters, and we're only using half of the capability of these repeaters. So, so if you didn't want data on yours? On certain ones, we do. So on the VHFs, we do, and we have a VHF on Buckhorn. We have a VHF on Squaw. We have one on Almagre. You want to cover half the state, and it's virtually unused. Not saying you have to use it, but wouldn't you like that tool in your toolbox? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you like to have that piece of cheese? So, so what is the power of cheese? How does it apply to us? What can we do with the cheese? I said, this isn't what we did. This is why we did it. By building a backbone, we built interoperability. We built redundant paths that we can tunnel data back a different way than, than just Okay, we got one repeater link, and when that transmitter fails, we're done. We now self reroute and move in different directions. And uh, we also built a community of clubs that work together to accomplish a lot of stuff for the state. And I'm really proud, as a member here and a member of the other clubs, we don't nickel and dime each other, do we? We're just all into this for the common good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but James wants it. It's important. Yeah, and and that was part of the talk here. Of I know this, and I voted 
positively on James spending, but he really, you know, he has this favorite phrase. Everybody knows it. We are not a bank. And I love that phrase. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we, we also don't want to, we don't want to waste money, do we? And what we've been doing, and my hope was, how can we use this now? How are we using it and what can we do with it? We can do more remote stations if we have the appropriate sites to get data to there. We're not an internet provider, but we can, through our limited gateways, provide some ways so that if we wanted to do a remote receiver up on Rattlesnake, I know Greg doesn't like a lot of transmitters up there, I but have one up there. you do have one? Yeah, what well, Intel's a motorless target up there. I didn't want that. Okay. So, uh, I'm working on a remote station that the reason I'm doing this W1AW event is I'm trying to prove out the equipment that I want to do, uh, permanently do remotely for, the, for this event. So, uh, I'm going to use one of our sites that we got down in Strasburg. And we have an old AT&T tower. This thing has a platform on the top that's like 20 feet by 20 feet and a big steel I-beam sticking out that we could put the largest rotator we've ever seen on. And I'm looking to eventually put a very large HF Yagi up there. Oh, wow. We're gonna get started with a dipole. Oh, and this tower at the top, it's empty. Hmm. The only thing up there is the lightning rod. So we've got exclusive use of it. And the top of this tower is at 140 feet. So, but when I build this, I want, I want to be able to use it. I want people to be able to use it. It'll be hooked into the backbone, and if you have access to that, you can get on HF. Uh, do we want to do something on VHF as a club? And let's, remember one of my comments about the power of cheese was, how do we use it? How do we use it for our benefit and our community? And here's a microphone, David. Why not do something with D-Star? I mean, um, D-Star is widespread and uh, easy to use. It's, I, I think it's a little bit easier than, than DMR, even though I have two Anytones myself. Yeah. Uh, there are people that have D-Star uh, -Star equipment. Uh, there so aren't a lot of D-Star repeaters in Colorado. No, and we actually sponsored a full stack for I don't know, eight years, and it was hardly used, so we stopped supporting it with, with my time and the other arm ham guy's time. But if you want to do something with D-Star, remember I said, everything IP is invited. We can transport it, but we need people to do the work because if you're just saying, well, I need another band mode repeater, that job is already taken by my good friend Joe here, and I've <laughs> we've, we've had some good spirited debates that I challenge him, why am I doing this? Why should I give you X hours of my time when we've already done these other things? And sometimes he convinces me, yep, we gotta do it. Not often. And other times <laughs> I convince you, well, we've already got this. And we, we have some good debates, good friendly debates. Um, so it's never like point counterpoint on Saturday Night Live used to be. <laughs> We're all old enough in this room to remember those. So, but yeah, if people want to do D Star, we can do that. Which, yeah, yeah. Which one's Jane here? I don't know. Uh, I, I, Jane, you ignorant. Dan, you misguided fool. Uh, Greg, Greg, could you manage that for us? Could Greg, could you manage that for us? The D Star. Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, wait for it in uh, coming soon to something. you in a <laughs> decade or a century to come. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's everything IP. How do we want to use it, and can we serve with it? So please keep tasting the cheese, enjoying the cheese. Help me figure out what is the cheese. Like I said, it's more than just a nutritious and. Obviously, the uh, cheese growers were 
<laughs> the cheese growers were trying to, or the cheese growers. And if you have a spare block yeah. of cheese, remember, we're all hungry. Yeah. Well, and I even went to the buffet. I was going to try to find some cheese cubes, but all I could find was shredded, and I didn't think that would work as well. And I failed to bring a piece of it. Who would have thought I needed to bring cheese to a, to a buffet, uh, to a golden corral, but apparently they don't have cheese cubes. Uh, but... Uh, you know, it's, yeah, let's, how do we use the cheese? Where are we going with it? That's the power of cheese in amateur radio. So. Oh, yeah. You get some. He's a friend of yours. So, uh, any other questions? Or after all this talk about cheese, do I leave you to go to the buffet? This presentation was brought to you by the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club. For more information, visit our website, ncarc.net. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.